Good afternoon. I am Steve Swain, a professor of music here at Dartmouth College and the director of the college's Montgomery Fellows Program. This is the Montgomery Tartan. Um, we gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Western Abenaki, who were and are part of the Wabanaki Confederation. The Montgomery Fellows Program brings exceptional people to an exceptional place. That exceptional place, of course, is Dartmouth College. But it is also the Montgomery House on Occam Pond, which was purchased in 1977 through the generosity of Kenneth Montgomery, class of 1925, and his wife, Harl. Our fellow today, the college's 267th resident fellow, comes from the house uh, where he, his wife, and three boys are holding up right now, and he comes to share with us his life and wisdom. I'm sure that I'm not the only person in the last few years um, who has met someone on Zoom and then marveled that their physical presence differs from what one sees in that little window. In the case of our fellow, he's much taller than I expected, but he is every bit as charming and intelligent as everything I have encountered from and about him had led me to believe. As is my want, I have asked someone close to our fellow to introduce him to you. In this case, this person also happens to be my boss. Take of that what you will. David Coates, class of 1986, is the Pat and John Rosenwald professor in the Department of Computer Science. He is also our college's provost. He previously served as associate dean of the faculty for the sciences, as a core director at the Center for Technology and Behavioral Health, and as the executive director of the Institute for Security Technology Studies. Along those lines, his current research involves security and privacy in smart homes and wireless networks. So perhaps you'll have questions to ask Dave later. Meanwhile, he will tell you more about how he knows our fellow. Please join me in welcoming Dave. Thank you, Steve. It really is a pleasure to be here, and in a particular pleasure to have Cal Newport, class of 2004, back with us here at Dartmouth. Um, as Steve implied, I do have a connection to Cal, and so that's um, one reason why it's so important and, and, and such a pleasure for me to have an opportunity to introduce him. He is here for the summer, as Steve said, in the Montgomery House as a visiting professor of computer science and in fact, teaching a course in computer science this summer, Computer Science 19, writing about technology. And any of you who know or will soon learn about his background will understand that connection, that sort of dual um, personality that Cal brings to a course like that. Uh, it's a brand new course that he designed uh, and is teaching this summer for Dartmouth students. Uh, he graduated from Dartmouth in 2004 as an undergraduate computer science major. And in fact, he did his senior thesis with me. And so I went and looked up that senior thesis today, um, Simulating Mobile Ad Hoc Networks, a Quantitative Evaluation of Common Manet Simulation Models, which was a really exciting project that we did with a bunch of other people, including, coincidentally, Jason, a, a PhD student from that era who is back today uh, to visit Dartmouth as well, and people like Bob Gray, some names that many of you from that era might remember. That, paper, that thesis went on to produce multiple publications and in my opinion, to really shake up the community of that time who was trying to simulate these uh, wireless networks. After Dartmouth, he went on to MIT where he did his PhD in computer science with Nancy Lynch, uh, which is a name I'm sure many of my computer science colleagues will recognize. And then two years as a postdoc at MIT with Hari Balakrishnan, another name I think many of my CS colleagues will recognize. These are two leaders in the computing field. And since 2011, he's been a professor on the Faculty of Computer Science at Georgetown University, where he is now the Provost's Distinguished Associate Professor of Computer Science. Uh, very cool title, I must say. Um, <laughs> his, <coughs> just saying. Um, his, his scholarship there focuses on the theory of distributed systems, and he's published over 65 peer-reviewed publications. And I scrolled through that list and was pleased to see that I was co-author on his first publications, which grew out of his Dartmouth undergraduate thesis. So that was um, kind of exciting as well. More recently at Georgetown, he's been involved um, 
beyond, but ancillary to the field of computing. He's co-chaired a university-wide search committee to hire faculty for Georgetown's new Center for Digital Ethics, um, which is a really interesting direction and one that has uh, probably obviously very important uh, direction for um, us all to be considering at this point. He also co-chaired a working group overseeing a new collection of undergraduate degree programs centered on the intersection of technology, ethics, and society, uh, which again, I think is something uh, really interesting. I hope to learn more from Cal about, about those efforts. Um, and then um, the, where I think we'll be touching on today and hearing from him today, he's also been a prolific author for general audience publications. He's written seven books, including his first one as an undergraduate here at Dartmouth, I don't remember the title exactly, but it was How to Get Into College or something to that effect. And then another sequel, How to Succeed in College and things like that. And he's, um, several of his books have gone on to be New York Times bestsellers, selling over two million copies worldwide. He's also a contributing author to The New Yorker um, and has in, in The New York Times. And he hosts a podcast called Deep Questions. And so one of those deep questions, certainly in my mind, is about how worried should we be about AI. So with that, Cal, welcome back. Glad to have you here. All right, well, thank you. And uh, everyone should be feel some gratitude that I, I was deciding whether to do this topic or simulating wireless ad hoc networks, like qualitative analysis. And I figured, OK, it would be nostalgic but maybe I'd move on to something a little bit more recent. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Montgomery program. Thank you, Steve, for everything you've done. And Dave, thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for the chance to talk here today. So this is the topic uh, I'm going to tackle. I want to do a little bit more of my background because I think it's relevant for understanding the particular approach I take to these topics. So we just heard a bunch of these details. So this is. Uh, the only extant photo I can find of my time here at Dartmouth College. Uh, funnily enough, I haven't aged a day, so you know, I, I look exactly the same. Uh, the fact that I came out of Dartmouth, however, I think is really important for understanding how I'm going to talk about AI today and how, in general, I write about technology. So when I was here at Dartmouth, uh, I did computer science. So Dave talked about this. I was a computer science major went on and now I'm a computer science professor uh, and I write a fair number of just straight computer science papers. I typically work in the theory of distributed systems of all fields. But while also at Dartmouth is when I started writing. So I was a columnist for a while for the Dartmouth. Then I started writing for the Jack-O-Lantern, the, the humor magazine here. Ended up the editor in chief of the Jack-O-Lantern. Uh, and as mentioned, I, I sold my first book the, the summer between my junior and senior year, I wrote that in the, the Wheelock Apartments my fall of my senior year. And that first book was called How to Win at College. And it was uh, rules for success from the world's top students or something like this. It was the only way I could get entrance into the world of publishing as a 20-year-old I discovered was the write for students because, because I was a student. That is not a weird combination for Dartmouth. I think that might have been a weird combination in another school, maybe at a, a very large technical school. But at Dartmouth, this idea that you could be studying world-class science and at the same time embrace the arts, embrace something like writing, that was actually quite common. I was not even the only undergraduate I knew who was writing books while also doing a STEM major. So this is a very Dartmouthy sort of uh, liberal arts approach to thinking about the world of ideas. So Dartmouth planted that seed. In the last 10 years or so, I would say my writing has begun to uh, get closer to my role as an academic. So my last three books all deal with the impact of technology on work or on our personal lives or on our culture in some way. Most of my writing for The New Yorker also deals with technology and the way that it's impacting our lives. And I've come to believe it has been a real asset for my writing to have a, an academic background in computer science. I think for a lot of the topics that affect us today from the realm of the technological, having a grounding in how those technologies actually work is really important for trying to figure out what their impacts might be, to grapple with what these technologies might do. So that's the approach I want to take in my talk today. My plan is to break up our investigation of this question into two parts. First, let's actually get into the weeds. We'll put on the computer scientist hat. 
how does one of these new artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT actually work? And I'm, I'm not so interested in the completely in the weeds technical details. I, I don't want to get into neural networks and transformers in any sort of level of detail, but I want to come away from this part with you being conceptually comfortable with understanding how a computer program can have the sort of impressive conversations you would see with a tool like ChatGPT. Then mirroring my approach to this writing, in the second part of the talk, we will take this understanding out for a spin. We will use this understanding as the foundation for tackling a collection of the big questions people are asking right now, the things they're concerned about with AI. But instead of coming at these arbitrarily, we're going to come at them with a foundation of understanding of the, the underlying tool. So we're going to approach this topic today the same way I approach most of my writing on technology and its impact. OK, so before we get into part one, let's just do a couple terminologies. I want to set some foundation here, just so we're using the terms properly as we go forward. These are often used interchangeably in media coverage, and I think we should try to get this right. So we have the notion of a large language model that we'll learn more about. A large language model is an artificial intelligence system that you give it text, and it produces text in a human-like fashion. ChatGPT, by contrast, is a particular conversation program, something you can chat with through a web interface, that uses a large language model to help generate the text you see in those interactions. If you've seen these type of names, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, GPT-4, these are specific large language models. In particular, these are large language models that OpenAI has created, GPT-3, which was released publicly in 2020, is really the one that sparked this latest, I would say, revolution in the ability to interact with AI in a way that the average user sees as being very impressive. Finally, you may have heard this term, generative AI. This is more broad. This captures any artificial intelligence system that creates something, okay? So there's other things we would traditionally do with artificial intelligence. I think one of the, the Classic things we've focused on since at least the, the 1990s in particular is classification. So we've used artificial intelligence systems to try to figure out uh, what this picture is of. Maybe we use them to look at radiology films. Is there something uh, cancerous in here or not? So that's a typical classical use of artificial intelligence. Controlling things is another classical use, automatically driving cars. But generative AI produces things. So large language models that are used by tools like ChatGPT are one example of a generative AI system, but generative AI is a much broader category. I just want to be able to use these terms and we, we have these, these subtle nuances actually nailed down. All right, so let's get into it. Part one, how does ChatGPT work? All right, so let's start with an actual ChatGPT conversation. I whipped this up the other day in preparation for this talk. This is what I asked ChatGPT. I said, write a paragraph about how a Dartmouth education prepares students to deal with both the promise and perils of technology. And it, okay, it interpreted paragraph to be a little bit longer than I might otherwise think. But it gave, <laughs> it gave what I would call a reasonable answer. Right? Uh, I won't read the whole thing. But you, if you skim this, you're like, yeah, this is a you know, reasonable answer. A Dartmouth education is uniquely positioned to equip students with the necessary skills and knowledge to navigate, and so on. And you see, it's. It reads like natural language and is dealing with the topic. Right, so this is a, a classic example of using this program. So how does it do this? How did it go from that initial question to this response? So let's, let's zoom out and think about what ChatGPT as a program is going to do. ChatGPT is going to use a large language model to help generate a response to my question. Now, I use the free version of ChatGPT for this example that anyone can sign up for. That uses a particular large language model that's known as GPT 3.5. So what is the ChatGPT program going to do? Well, it's going to take my question. That was the question I typed into the chat interface. And it is going to pass that question as input to the large language model. Now, the question is, what does this large language model spit out in return? And this is where it's sometimes surprising for people. What's it going to spit out is just a single word. What the large language models at the core of ChatGPT do is they take text and say, here is a single word by which you can reasonably expand that text. 
And even that's not exactly accurate. It doesn't deal with words. It deals with tokens, which are parts of words. So some words are actually made up of multiple tokens. And it doesn't output just a single choice. It outputs a probability distribution over choices. So it sort of tells you, here's a bunch of options, and I'll tell you how confident I am about each option. But for our purposes, we can just think about large language models as word outputters. So this is great. The word A is a reasonable way to extend this input. So what does the ChatGPT control program do? It takes that word, it puts it at the end of the original question. We have a slightly longer sentence now. We give that as input to the model. It spits out another word. Well, given this sentence, here's another word that would make sense to expand this with. So then the, the program would add that to the text. And now we're talking to the model again with a slightly longer sentence. And the model says, oh, here's another word that would make sense to actually expand it. The model has no memory of what it's doing. In fact, this model is so large that it's probably being split over multiple processors. There's no one computer running it. There's giant data centers with many, many, many copies of these models running. It's not even clear word to word if you're even talking to the same copies of these large language models. It's a static model. You give it text. It outputs a word. The control program then just keeps feeding it longer and longer text until it feels that it has a, a full answer. And then it will return that, return that to the user. So that's what's happening mechanistically when you talk to something like ChatGPT. So let's zoom in a little bit on this large language model and ask how does it make these choices of what words to output? So the first challenge is the words it outputs have to expand the text in a grammatically correct manner, right? So if we keep feeding our expanding text into this model to grow the response, we see in ChatGPT, like in our example just uh, on the screen before, it gives you grammatically correct natural responses. So how does it do this? Well, I want to introduce a, a high-level concept that's going to more or less give us some intuition about how a program might do this. So let's say, for example, this is the text that we are passing into a large language model. We have, let's say, uh, an initial question from a user plus the beginning of a response. And we're asking the model, give me a single word to expand this answer by. One thing you could do here is say, let's focus on the last words, the most re relevant words, the recent words in this text were given as input. And now let's take these words. We'll call this our target phrase. So in our example here, let's use the quick brown, the last three words of the input as our target phrase. Let's go now look at a lot of actual text written by humans. So real text, books and articles, uh, web pages, whatever, real text written by real people. And let's look for that particular phrase, the quick brown, to show up in actual text that is written by actual people. And every time we find that phrase, let's write down what word followed it. And so maybe as we go through all of these books, we find fox shows up a lot of times because there's the poem, a quick brown fox jumps over the lazy brown dog. Maybe that shows up in a lot of sources. But sometimes we find a phrase, the quick brown river. And maybe once we find a quick brown steed. Let's just write this all down. And what we can do is say, great, these are now candidates for words to extend this text by. And we can be pretty confident that these are grammatically correct because they actually followed this phrase in real books written by real people who know the rules of grammar. And so now all we have to do is select one of these. And in fact, what we can do is use how many times they showed up as a confidence. So we almost certainly will choose fox, but maybe we'll choose river, and probably won't choose steed, but we could. We could. So we could use how often they show up uh, to weight it. This approach, which is known as uh, in-gram text expansion, this actually works really well. Here's, a, here's an actual. Uh, let me go to an actual example here. So this sentence, I generated this as part of a uh, New Yorker piece I wrote on how ChatGPT works. This sentence was generated using exactly that strategy. I started it with five words. I continued walking in this. And then what it did is it just slid a sliding window looking at the last five words, looking for where those five words showed up in the particular source text we used was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It would randomly search this book to find the last five words, see what followed it, write that down, slide the window forward to the new last five words, randomly search the book to find where that shows up, sees what followed it. With just a single source text, it wrote what I think is a very good sentence. I continued walking in this matter for some time, and I feared the effects of the Damon's disappointment. 
Now, is this exactly what something like a large language model does? No, it's not exactly searching through source text and trying to find a phrase and counting how many times that phrase shows up. But something like that, as we'll, we'll see when we briefly talk about the implementation details, something like that is baked into the neural networks inside these language models. In its training, it is baking in these connections between these phrases were followed by these words. So the, the rules of grammar are being extracted from actual grammatical, grammatically correct text. All right, grammatically correct text, however, is not enough. Part of what makes ChatGPT so impressive is that it's not just natural language, but the language actually seems to understand what it is being asked. We asked it in my example to talk about the promise and perils of uh, technology in a Dartmouth course, and it understood that. It talked about a course for Dartmouth and how it dealt with promises and perils of technology. So how does it spit out a word that's not just grammatically correct, but also is going to understand what it's supposed to be saying? All right, so let's return to our example from before. So let's say this was our text, and we looked at the most recent words, and we found a collection of grammatically correct candidate next words. All right, that'll get us a grammatically correct sentence. But let's say in this case we change the question. So maybe in this case uh, what the question said was write me a poem about a horse race. So something we could do here is feature detection. We could actually look for patterns in the text that tells us something about what we're supposed to be writing, we here being the language model. And so maybe we have a pattern detector that says, okay, we're, we're doing a poem, and oh, the subject is horse race. And now let's assume that this pattern, once it's triggered, is hooked up to some logic that says, okay, what we wanna do then is when we look at our potential grammatically correct next words, let's put some extra emphasis on words that are related to horse racing. So maybe in this case, we say, look, Steve only showed up once, but that's very related to horses and horse ra racing. So let's pretend like it showed up a bunch of times. Let's actually give that more emphasis. Now, is this exactly how something like the large language model is producing text that makes sense? Not exactly this, but conceptually, something like this is happening. It detects features in the text that it is expanding. It uses those features to influence which potential grammatically correct next words that it outputs, to influence them towards what's actually being asked about. Now even here you might say, okay, yes, that example is very simple, but you've probably seen uh, stunningly nuanced responses, right? I mean, this is what makes ChatGPT so uh, impressive to people is you ask it about almost anything, and it really has a way of answering. It figures it out. I'll tell you about a Dartmouth education and technology and the promises and perils. And so the question is, okay, how do we move from such a simple example, uh, horse racing, we're gonna emphasize steed, to the type of stunningly nuanced responses that we've seen floating around the internet? And here, the answer is not some clever new mechanism. The answer here is actually scale. I think this is the thing that we have a hard time wrapping our, our minds around, is it's not that there is a, in, incredibly more complicated mechanism than ingrams and feature detection. It's just that the number of patterns that it recognizes and the number of logical chains it has between particular patterns and how it biases towards particular rules, the sheer volume of these is at a scale that is hard for humans to understand. So what I did in my New Yorker piece is I, I took the size of GPT-3 which is smaller than the models used by ChatGPT. We don't know how much smaller because after GPT-3, OpenAI stopped telling us these things. So we don't actually know how big the uh, models are that are being used right now, but GPT-3 we know is smaller. And I did a little bit of a back of the envelope calculation and said, well, what if we just took the definition of this program and just started printing it out in the average font size and packaging it in the average size books it would be, depending on how you did it, multiple millions of average size books. You could fill an entire Baker Berry library full of books just describing different patterns it might recognize and different chains of logic it might use to connect that pattern to selecting words. You could fill Baker and Berry all of those stacks and still have way more books the, than you had room to actually put into it. This incomprehensible scale is part of what allows these models to be so impressive is that they can have rules for things you wouldn't even think about. They know about 
Dartmouth and technology and uh, talking about technology and talking about a course and talking about a Dartmouth course. What about talking about a Dartmouth course and combine that with a rule about talking about technology? There's a book on the shelf in our, our metaphorical library here somewhere for all of those things that we take off and it knows exactly how to start biasing words to make that answer actually work. Scale is at the key to what made these suddenly so impressive. I think it's really important to recognize this timeline about the development of this technology is that we've had large language models that could respond to text and produce text. We have had these in the academic context for a long time. This is not a particularly new technology. There were some uh, advancements that happened around 2017 with uh, some of the in the weeds details. Um, but for the most part, this technology had been around. What was the thing that made GPT-3 and 3.5 jumped to everyone's notice as being way better than what they had seen before. And the answer there was scale. This is what OpenAI did. This was OpenAI's bold bet, is they said, what if we made these things 10 times larger than anyone else had ever done? The largest large language model before GPT-3 came out had on the order of tens of billions, low tens of billions, of what they call parameters, the numbers that defined it. GPT-3 jumped up to 170 billion. GPT-4 may be as large as a trillion parameters. We don't know for sure because, again, they won't tell us anything. But we know it's large. It could potentially be that large. So OpenAI's innovation was really less about trying to figure out some sort of new way to, to make these things function, some sort of new type of model. A big part of OpenAI's innovation was how do we make this thing 10 times larger? And that was really hard to do, as we'll see here in a second. It's very difficult to make these things that large. It's very difficult to train them. It's very difficult to run them. They're too big to fit on a single computer. You need multiple processors even to just generate a single word. I mean, it seems sort of crazy to try to make these things so big. And there's a really good hypothesis that if we blow up their size, they'll be so big that they'll just spin off. You know, The answers will make no sense. There'll be too much information. It'll be too big. And they tried it, and it actually just worked much better. So scale is at the core of why those relatively simple concepts actually work so well when we use them in practice. All right, so how do we actually implement all of this? Well, this is where most people spend their time, I would say, when talking about large language models. I want to spend very little time on these details, so let's just, let's just touch on this quite briefly. This here shows you the basic architecture of a GPT large language model. And here's the key things I want you to understand. This blue box, see the word 96 next to it? In GPT-3, there's 96 of these in a row, call these layers. And in the middle of each of these layers is this yellow box, it's a neural network. So what actually happens when you submit your text to a large language model is it gets converted to numbers because computers understand numbers better than they understand lit. Uh, letters, and then it gets pushed through 96 of these layers, one after another. And in each of these layers, it's being looked at by a neural network. And what these neural networks are doing is this feature detection. They're looking for these patterns. And the reason why there's 96 is we, we learned in the 1990s that a smart way to build these neural networks is to have a bunch of layers. Because what can happen is the, the lower layers can look at really general features and then pass on what they observe to the upper layers, which are smarter. And they can use those lower layer observations to make more complicated uh, decisions or recognize more complicated patterns. But essentially, we're just moving through these layers, detecting more and more complicated patterns. And at the very top, what pops out is actually a, you could think of it as a list of every possible word with a number next to every possible word that says, here's how confident we are that this should be the word that comes next. So this is what's in the guts of all this is neural networks. And these neural networks are more or less, I mean, this is all squished together. They're more or less implementing something like the concepts we talked about. All of those statistics from looking at real sources during training, this phrase is often followed by this phrase, it's sometimes followed by this phrase, that's all baked into the weights of these neural networks. These pattern detection rules, oh, this is asking for a horse race. That means we should push words that have horse-related meanings, we should push their emphasis. That's all baked into the weights of these neural networks. That's all, so we have this one single type of structure, neural networks, into which all of this type of logic is actually pushed. So the question becomes, how do you actually train these neural networks to know all of these things? And there the answer is, it's very expensive and it's very hard. This is a, an actual image of one of OpenAI's data centers. Uh, 
one of my sources at OpenAI told me that for training the, the new version of uh, GPT, so I guess for GPT-4, they have custom buildings, Microsoft built it for them, custom buildings that have custom innovations in cooling. They had to invent new cooling systems that never existed before because in these buildings to train GPT-4, they have 30,000 processors. 30,000 dedicated processors, they're called graphical processing units. So they're, they're computers that do nothing but the type of math you need to try to train neural networks. 30,000 of these in a custom-built building. They have a couple of these, one in the Midwest and one in the uh, North Northwest. Custom building, custom cooling, and it takes days if not weeks of full-out computation, millions if not tens of millions of dollars worth of compute time to train one of these models. So they, they throw at these models basically everything written that they can get their hands on, a snapshot of the entire internet, tens if not hundreds of thousands of books. Every bit of text they could basically get their hands on in digital form is used to help train these models. The technique for training is not that important for our understanding. What is important is to get to that immense scale of, of rules that we talked about, that Baker library full of rules, they have to use a lot of text, they have to have a very big network, they have to have a huge building, and they have to spend millions and millions of dollars just training, just training this. So that's what's actually happening, that's actually how you implement it. And you could spend a lot, a computer scientist could spend a lot of time trying to understand all of these little details. This was the break, this stuff here was the breakthrough in 2017. It was a way of looking at text and figuring out how related different words are to each other and how relevant different words are. That tends to help if you do that before you go into the feed forward network. Uh, there's a lot of other little details that OpenAI, they did some of these, academia did some of these, but again, scale is really the key thing. So I want you to just have this conceptual picture in mind when you think about something like ChatGPT is that you have this 96 layer behemoth that spits out words and a control program that just adds those words one by one until you have an answer. Okay, so now that we understand that, <laughs> we can get to this question, how worried should we be? And hopefully we can now answer this question with a little bit more grounding with a little bit more confidence. So the way I wanted to do this was just take four questions. These are the four big questions I often hear. Is ChatGPT alive? Does it represent an existential threat? Or is it soon to represent an existential threat? Will it take my job? Will it change my job? These are the most common questions I hear when I do uh, talks on this or briefings on this or in response to my articles. So I want to just go through these one by one. Let's use our understanding of how language models work to try to answer them. All right, so question one, is ChatGPT alive? And if not, is a near future version going to be? So maybe not GPT-4-based ChatGPT is alive, but maybe GPT-7-based ChatGPT will be alive. It's easy to see why this could be a concern when you just interact with these tools. Uh, we are a linguistic species. Language is very human to us. When we have an interaction with ChatGPT, it can really seem like there is some sort of conscious on the other side because we have no other experience of having linguistically sophisticated interactions with an entity that did not have a mind similar to ours. And you see a lot of this rhetoric surrounding these technologies right now. A lot of this rhetoric of alien intelligence has been introduced, a lot of uh, language of uncertainty. We don't even know what this is or what is gonna happen. There's articles we'll see, uh, there's sort of a, a famous one, for example, Kevin Roos wrote for the New York Times about interacting with Google's large language model and how unsettled he got after the model tried to convince him to divorce his wife because it was in love with him. And he ended this article saying like, I don't know what we're doing here, but this is, this is something new, this is something eerie. So is it alive or can it become alive? My contention here is once we understand how these large language models work, the answer is no. A large language model, the architecture and operation of a large language model is incompatible with essentially any common sense notion of self-awareness or consciousness. There's a couple things that makes these models very ill-suited for that state. The, the most important one is the models themselves have no malleable memory or state themselves. It is a snapshot. We train this thing once and we deploy thousands of copies in data centers. They do not change as they're generating your responses. It is the exact same model, the exact same definition, generating every word of your response. In fact, the model itself is being implemented by multiple processors. In fact, different words of a response that you're, 
receiving from ChatGPT might have been generated by different processors altogether. It, they, they don't particularly care what it is they're generating the next word for. They just give me text, I'm going to run it through my neural networks, here's the output. So it is very difficult to have a notion of consciousness where you can't update your state. There's no memory you can update, no understanding of yourself or your place in the world that is evolving, that you can react to with incentives. Large language models are static. They can't do that. So that's, not, that's not fundamental what they can do. Similarly, the wiring of these things is very simple. One of the trade-offs we had to make to make large language models with 100 billion or a trillion parameters is we had to make the wiring pretty simple. So these are simple feed-forward neural networks. We had to make them very simple so that these dedicated processors that are very good at one particular type of operation would be very good at implementing these things. So people who actually study neural correlates of consciousness, so people who actually try to study where consciousness may or may not arise, for example, in the human nervous system, uh, are pretty clear you're almost certainly going to need very complicated architectures of neural networks to make this happen. Recursive recurrent structures to feed back to themselves and have these interesting whirling loops of self-referentiality. None of that's in a large language model. That's too complicated to run at this scale. It's very simple feed forward, which means the information only moves forward layer by layer. So there's nothing about these models themselves that we, we can't just make them larger and expect something like self-awareness. That being said, baked into these large language models is an incredibly sophisticated set of concept detectors, right? To be very good at spitting out words, as we talked about, these models are very, very good at recognizing many, many different types of semantic concepts. So one could imagine a future in which a large language model is one module among many in building a machine that is self-aware. Now, this machine would need other types of modules. It would need some sort of incentive module. It would need some sort of model of itself in the world that it is constantly updating. It would need functional uh, competence modules that are unrelated to linguistics. So it is possible, though, that large language models would be a part of something like that in the future. And in fact, maybe it's an important part. Maybe it's the hardest part of building something like a self-aware AI. But no one is really working on that right now. That's not where the money is. The money is actually in making these language models better and hooking them into more practical or productive applications. So it is possible they could be part of something self-aware. They will not accidentally become self-aware. So does it then represent a looming existential threat? Well, we can, we can interpret this in two ways. I, I think the, the more hyperbolic understanding of this question is we could think of as the Nick Bostrom superintelligence model. This is the, what if these get very smart, they'll be smarter than us, and then they can toy around with us, and if they want to, they can just you know, launch the missiles and kill us all because we're in the way of what the computers want to do. This is the superintelligence hypothesis that once a computer is a little bit smarter than us, then it can train itself to be even smarter, and then that one can train itself to be even smarter, and you'd have an exponential explosion in intelligence, right? This was a, a a key concern in artificial intelligence that arose around 2016 or 2017. Uh, it came out of, there's a conference that Max Tegmark at MIT organized in Puerto Rico um, about this topic. It was after that conference when you had a lot of tech leaders. You had Bill Gates, you had Stephen Hawking, you had Elon Musk come out and make these statements of we should be worried about AI. That's where that all came from. They weren't worried about something that was happening now. What they were saying is, in the future, this might be possible, so why don't we think about this now before we develop technology where this could be possible? Is ChatGPT going to get us there? And then there, because of what we just learned, the answer is no. ChatGPT by itself is not self-aware, nor can it ever be, so it's not going to launch the missiles. But there's another definition of threat here that I think is a little bit trickier, and I can give more of a, I have a bit of a contrarian take on this that, that uh, is not necessarily widely shared. There is another sense of threat here, which is, OK, no, it's not that these are going to become super intelligent, but it's going to uh, magnify the ability for humans to do bad things. And that this is going to be, this is going to be the real threat. We can use it to produce, for example, uh, very effective disinformation or really good scams because we can feed it actual letters from the IRS and say, write something like this, and it'll really sound like an actual IRS letter. And so it's, uh, maybe this is the threat, is that we're, we're introducing this new ability, these new abilities for humans to do bad things. And there, I think the answer is, well, yes, it does introduce new abilities to do bad things. That is true. Is it a 
magnified threat of that as compared to other innovations. I don't know what the answer is to that yet. I think this is an important thing to keep in mind. What LLMs can do is essentially, at scale, things that humans can already do, right? It generates natural sounding text based off of actual human text. So it can produce, for example, disinformation. Of course, humans can also produce disinformation. So it's not producing, it's not introducing a, a new threat into the cultural ecosystem. It's just scaling up an existing type of threat. And then the question is, what is the impact of that going to be? And I think this is a, a, a big question and a complicated question. But if we look, for example, at just that notion of bad information, there there's an argument to be made, for example, that really the damage there it was done when we introduced the internet and we introduced social media. That when it comes to bad information, the real scary thing is curation. The problem is not we don't have enough bad ideas. The problem is how do we identify the really, really sticky ones and spread it really quickly to a lot of people. That's the scary thing. And Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok already solved that problem. So in some sense, perhaps increasing the amount of bad information is not the problem. Scale is not the problem. It is how do we get two or three really sticky ideas and spread them. And unfortunately, that is a Pandora's box that was already open. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is there's, there's a, a way to re re react to this somewhat optimistically. Um, it's not going to fire the missiles. It is going to introduce more bad behavior. Um, but it's unclear if that new bad behavior is going to be somehow outsized or at a scale we did not already see with, let's say, the introduction of the internet or perhaps the introduction of uh, social media. So the jury's still out on that, but there's at least a, a somewhat optimistic take. That is, if you consider, oh, we already screwed things up to be optimistic. But. <laughs> All right, let's get more pragmatic. This is an article I'm writing right now, actually. So I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs into this question. There's a lot of headlines like this that have been around. ChatGPT could see the loss of 300 million jobs worldwide. That's from April. Right? There are a lot of other headlines like this. Brookings had a big uh, report like this. OpenAI researchers put out a report like this that said this technology is going to affect 80% of jobs in the US. It's going to have at least 10% of their activities impacted by these language models. 20% of the jobs are going to have 80% or more of their activities uh, impacted by language models. With no irony at all, by the way, the way they did this research is had a large language model <laughs> automatically summarize which jobs it would be relevant. So I think that's <laughs> a completely straight face. They said, yeah, it's fine. It's good at it. Um, so if you're looking at this question, right, you say, OK, is, should I be worried about that? Now, you may have some confusion, right? If you've used ChatGPT in its current form, you might be saying, how is this relevant to my job? Most knowledge work jobs uh, are not built around generating text on general topics. You might say, this doesn't seem very relevant to my job, but I can go to OpenAI, chat.openai.com, and talk to this thing. But really what these prognostications are talking about is this new evolution of this technology that's happening right now. It started with a feature that OpenAI called plugins, but it's going past there. Uh, the future of this technology, and by future I mean the next year, so this is very near future, is to connect these large language models to your data, so not just what they were trained on, but you can have the ability to have them actually uh, think about, talk about, summarize information relevant to your job, a report that your company just produced, uh, an email thread that you're a part of. Hey, look at this email thread where we're trying to discuss a meeting and find a time that works for everyone. So uh, this is the evolution that's happening right now, is this will be able to work with your data. Uh, and the other part of this revolution is these models will then be able to also talk to other software. So now you'll be able to say something with these new generations of these models. You'll be able to say something like, summarize this email thread and email it to my team. And then the language model could read your recent email thread, write a summary, then talk to your email program and send that email uh, to your team. So ChatGPT plugins exist right now in a limited, in a limited form that they're trying to expand. Uh, Microsoft has a product like this based off of GPT language models called Copilot. That right now is in limited testing. There are about 600 people testing it. But the idea with Copilot is uh, in any Microsoft Office application, you press a button, this little text box comes up, and you can just ask it anything relevant to these applications. Hey, go through my spreadsheet, take out every row where there's a blank cell in column B, and it will go and work with your spreadsheet. Or you know, take this email thread find a time that works for all of us, send the calendar invite to all of our Outlook calendars. So they're testing something like this right now. Uh, Google Bard is able to work 
with up-to-date information. So this is really the future, and this is what these type of prognostications are looking at. So are jobs going to go away, or in particular, are general knowledge worker jobs going to be uh, drastically reduced? And here, uh, the current state of my reporting, I would say, is uh, no. And the reason why no is you have to open up the hood on how these plugins actually work. They don't change the language model. They don't touch the language models. The language models take millions of dollars and weeks to train. Uh, what they actually do is just add a smart software wrapper around the language models that just writes questions for the language models on your behalf. So if you say something like, summarize the key challenges from this report, normal non-AI software looks at that question sees that you're looking for key challenges, loads up the report, searches the report for paragraphs that has key challenges, and then writes a chat GPT query where it pastes all these paragraphs in there and says, okay, look at this text and summarize it. And then it takes the response from chat GPT, ordinary non-smart software, takes the response and you know, emails it or does what you want to do with it. So the actual underlying language model technology doesn't change, and these language models um, are not good at highly specialized or highly skilled tasks. They're not good at tasks that require a nuanced understanding of particular people or how a particular organization runs. None of that was in its training. These language models aren't good at coordination or planning. So it can't take over efforts on your behalf. It can't plan a conference for you, right, because it's unable to actually, uh, these word generators, can't generate long-term plans and have these plans evolve over time. So the most likely future is not that these productivity-enhanced language models are going to uh, eliminate massive numbers of jobs so much as they will change them. So my answer here is yes. And I think this change will be on the scale of email. I think this change will be on the scale of networks and Google and the internet being added to the workplace. And these are not small changes, right? These are tools that fundamentally change the rhythm of a lot of jobs. The average knowledge worker checks an email inbox or instant messenger chat channel once every six minutes. That is a much different experience of work than in 1993 before email was widely used in most office situations. That's the scale of what I think is going to happen. These productivity-enhanced language models will be helpful for tackling uh, administrative or logistical tasks, simplifying them or automating simple self-contained tasks, much in the way that you know, starting in 2006 or 7, you could start asking Google for information that was otherwise you had to spend a lot of time finding. It'll be that, but widely, I'd say more widely distributed, more different things it can do. So I do think the nature of knowledge work jobs will change. But what the jobs actually are probably won't. And the scale of that change will be similar to changes we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years before, which is not to say nothing, but also is not necessarily like some prognosticators are talking about, uh, like the arrival of industrialization to an otherwise agricultural economy. The changes will not be on that type of a fundamental economic rewiring scale. All right, so I want to summarize here so we can, uh, we can move to questions. Uh, we talked about two parts. We have two parts in this talk today. First, how does ChatGPT work? And the key there is language models are word predictors. And the basic ideas about how they do that aren't that hard, but they're super impressive because they're so super large. And the second part, we talked about how worried should we be. And essentially, my take was the really big concerns people have, I tend not to share. But there are changes coming. And I think, in particular, uh, our experience of office or computer style work, that will change. I think that is a change. There's other narrow places I didn't discuss where we also see changes. Academia is going to be affected. Uh, other types of, there's a couple other places we'll see some effect as well. So there will be changes, but we're not about to have Skynet launch the missile. So I think that's roughly where we're going to be there. Um, I'll conclude by saying I am considered, I think, in the world of, of kind of cultural commentators on this topic to be a little bit far on the, OK, it's OK, <laughs> it will be OK type side. I think there's a lot more excitement in uh, either, oh my god, I'm going to make a million dollars a week with my automated setup, and here's my YouTube video. Or on the other side, let me write this really sort of dour think piece about how uh, the future is going to be destroyed. I'm considered to be a little bit, perhaps, you know, Pollyannish about it. But I'm confident in that position because I've spent a lot of time thinking and dealing with the actual technology. And I think when we base our analysis in the actual technology, not in how we imagine such a technology might not work, not in how we imagine what type of mind might be producing this text and what else could that type of mind do. When we move past that and get into the boring details of language models and transformers and neural networks, I do think it's not that we should let our guard down, but our 
cortisol level can decrease just a little bit. All right, so at that, I think I should uh, thank you for your attention um, and switch over to questions. All right. So we. Right, ahead, so Steve. yeah, uh, uh, there's going to be a microphone over there. Josh, could you take that one and turn it on? Um, and uh, I will move around to give you the microphone, or if you want to come over here to the microphone. But Cal will field your question. So uh, uh, this is for the tape. So who has a question? We have, we have one right next to you. Yeah. And if you'll stand. Sure. Uh, this is a way of asking uh, whether uh, AI is likely to put writers out of work. I want to go back to the first paragraph you showed us, uh, which is ChatGBT response to the question, uh, how well does Dartmouth College prepare students yep. for the promise and perils of technology? A long, long paragraph. Mark Twain once defined the purpose of education much more succinctly. He said, the purpose of education is not to fill a bucket, but to light a fire. And I wonder how well or how likely it is that a uh, an AI system based a large language model of uh, grammatical correctness and uh, 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 conventions of discourse, uh, how likely it would be to produce a pair of metaphors like that? Um, yeah, I think that's a very good question. There's a whole field that's trying to study exactly what you could and could not expect out of a large language model. A lot of this work is actually being done in cognitive science right now. There's a lot of cognitive scientists who are running experiments on language models that you would otherwise typically run on a human subject. And it's, it's pretty interesting what they're actually uh, pulling out. Uh, it gets a little bit technical to say exactly what they can and can't do. But I think the broader point here is, in the end, uh, the text being produced is based on text it's seen. Uh, the, the words it's producing, the patterns of speech, that, that, that pattern of speech we saw in that Dartmouth response. It, it's probably being biased towards a, an actual source it saw, someone wrote that was talking about a class or talking about a Dartmouth class. Uh, so it can write about what it's seen. It can write in the styles that it has seen. And so I think the, the short answer would be, uh, no, you're not gonna have deep creative insight. And I think another thing that's gonna prevent interesting creative output outside of just occasional accidental sort of serendipitous, really interesting responses is that unlike a human, these language models spit out words. That's all they do. They have no capability. So a human can produce a whole response. And we can mull it and think about it. Is this good or not? What's not quite right about this? Well, over here, this is a little bit flabby as metaphors go. And let me rethink about this. And we can consider an entire response in our head. And we can evaluate it and run it against intuition and experience. A language model can spit out a word a word that it thinks extends the sentence in a good way. And once it started going, you know, it can't go back and stop. And this is why, for example, we have hallucination issues with these models. They're just trying to spit out words that make sense. And if those words start putting it down a path towards something that's false, it has no way of looking at its response and saying, well, this quote never happened. This person never said it. It's just playing the game of how do I keep expanding this in a way that makes sense. So I tend to fall into the camp that, no, uh, you're not going to be able to regularly harvest what I would think of as real sort of interesting human creativity out of the models. Is there a question on that side? And, and I'll say after this, we'd like to feature, no, no offense here, uh, students too. So that, uh, <laughs> students next time. Thank you, Cal, for a great presentation. Um, for those of us, I just want to follow that question. For those of us who teach writing at the college, yeah. one of the things that's beginning to happen now is we're beginning to develop into two camps. One camp says we just are going to make sure that nobody uses uh, chat GPT or AI in the production of writing and somehow figure out a way of doing that. And others who are uh, hoping to embrace that and be able to use chat GPT in the yeah. classroom as a tool, yeah. a pedagogical tool as well. And I was wondering where you fell on that. And if it's the latter, then how you think we could use chat GPT as a pedagogical tool yeah. rather than ban it from the classroom yeah. entirely. And thank yeah. you very much. No, it, it's a very big question and not just for writing, but for, for lots of different academic uh, issues. There's not great answers yet. So, so we just, uh, the provost at Georgetown just formed this task force that I'm on to look at the pedagogical uses of artificial intelligence. We're trying to answer these questions for Georgetown. I would say my instinct is falling towards the, how do we use these tools in a pedagogically advantageous manner? Um, my main example looking back is I, I think, especially the students who are here right now, don't have a memory, but the professors do, of how disruptive, for example, the internet plus an actual effective search engine like Google 
how disruptive that was to what we did as professors. I mean, the ability to find almost any information, including, by the way, past problem sets, answers to this uh, textbook, uh, this became very common. Uh, and it really changed things. And we had to figure, how do we teach in a world in which all information is available? All these examples are available. Um, so I, I think somehow this is going to have to be worked in. There's a lot of, I, I think, there's some short-term issues we have to face right away. Uh, even teach, I teach mathematics often at Georgetown. The problem with elementary uh, mathematics, so I ran, for example, my final exam from undergraduate discrete mathematics for computer scientists. I ran question by question through ChatGPT, and I did very well. Uh, it could come up with the answers and uh, give good explanations for them, right? So the era, I think we're lucky that this, this technology came right after the COVID virtual era, right? Because I think the, the era of virtual exams is not going to work very well. But on the other hand, I then ran my uh, doctoral theory of computation final exam through ChatGPT, and it had perfectly reasonable sounding answers that were completely wrong, right? Because that was... That was more complicated. A theory of computation question is much more conceptual. There's many different parts that have to connect together, whereas if I'm asking you to calculate an expectation, you know, that's a pattern it's seen 100 times, uh, and it can do it. So I think there's going to be a lot of changes that are happening right now, a lot more of in-class things happening. Uh, this is the death, for example, of the do a quick blog post or reading response before class. That's gone because ChatGPT is very good at that. Uh, my class here at Dartmouth, we do that in the first five minutes of class. We, we, we type them in class uh, for that very reason. Um, but in the end, I do think it is going to have to be a tool. I've messed around with using it as an interactive tutor. It's actually pretty good on some of the concepts I've tried. There's a professor at Georgetown who's trying to master using it to help make rhetoric and argument better, where you actually run arguments by ChatGPT, have it find weaknesses. Uh, and it turns out if you use it right, that can be useful. And so I think that's what we're going to have to see. And then once you get to higher level writing, or professional writing for sure, um, you can't have ChatGPT do that for you. That's a problem. That was a perfectly reasonable paragraph it wrote about Dartmouth technology, promise, and peril. Uh, but you couldn't put that in a New York Times op-ed, you know, where every sentence matters, and the pacing matters, and every piece has to connect. And, and so once we get to a certain level, it's not going to be able to do the work for us. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think we are going to be using it. Um, we are going to be using it, not trying to ban it. It's probably where we'll end up. Is there a student question on this side? I see students on the, OK, right here. Hi, my name is Josh. I'm at 25. Um, I was wondering, um, so like, what are some of the benefits AI could bring to our society in terms of solving larger problems? What are some of the drawbacks, and how should government regulate against those potential uh, drawbacks and ill effects yeah. in society? Uh, well, these are all good questions. Um, the regulation question, I don't know. I, it's, I've, I've recently been doing some briefings on the Hill. It's one of the advantages of being at Georgetown is the senators will summon you if they think you know about something because you're nearby. And I was recently at a bipartisan you know, big round table, and uh, I didn't have a good answer to that. And there was no consistent, no one had a good answer to it. This was basically my takeaway was we don't know what the right answer is there yet. Um, so I don't know the right way to regulate it. And I've, I've been bouncing back and forth on this. I and mean, there are times when I sometimes will fall towards the, when I'm in a mood, I'll fall towards the more extreme side. Like there, um, there's a letter going around now from Douglas Preston of the Authors Guild, the head of the Authors Guild, that has a huge number of signatories from a lot of famous writers. And he is, uh, what they're pushing for, and there's a lawsuit about this now as well, is, hey, you can't use our books to train your models. Right? If you want your model to spit out original interesting text, you can't just use our books. Now, the thing about that is the goal is not oh, somehow us and the Authors Guild want to get paid. It would be uh, this would make it impossible for generative AI to work at that scale. And there are some efforts, I think, uh, that are out there right now that would basically, from a regulatory standpoint, make it impossible for you to have a very large, large language model. Because you can't suck in all this text if you said, look, you have to pay people. That's, you, then you can't train the models, and you want to have those models. And sometimes when I get into a mood, I say, maybe that's not the worst thing. I mean, maybe we could, as human society, make the decision of, well, we want creative output to remain human. And then sometimes you get in, I get in another mood, and you know, I, uh, my, my, my libertarian hat comes on, for, falls on my head somewhere. I'm like, well, we can't just stop these technologies. So it's, a, it's, a hard, it's an interesting question. Uh, as a source for good, I mean, I think there is things that's going to be good. I'm really interested in the pedagogical impacts. Um, it's a good tutor. Tutors are expensive. 
it can teach you, especially like high school or introductory college level mathematics, it's really good tutor. It'll explain how a theorem works. It'll give you examples. You can ask it questions. So I think that's going to be something that's going to be really interesting. I think in the workplace, if they can work out this plug-in technology properly, I think it actually is going to make a lot of the annoying administrative and logistical tasks that can get in the way of your primary goal in a lot of these knowledge work situations. I think it could actually be a net good there as well. To have a general assistant you can ask to do things, and it actually understands you and can do those things on your behalf could make work much more sustainable. So I think that could be positive as well. It's unclear if they're going to get around the security issues with this. The, uh, my source in OpenAI told me recently that one of the reasons why they've pulled back on expanding these plugins is they already found a really serious security hole. I mean, it's really dangerous to hook up these models to your programs and to your data because if someone can get a malicious request in there, you don't even, you know, suddenly it can send your data somewhere. It can steal your data. You can, you could take over these models. So it's, it's really a big security issue. But anyways, I think those will be the two areas. I think pedagogy, there could be cool things. Uh, I think in the world of work, there could be places where it actually makes work better, more sustainable. Um, so I think we will see some changes. Again, I don't necessarily see yet the massive transformations that other people are pushing. My goal is, let's, or the way I think about this is, let's, let's react to some changes first. I mean, up to this point, there still hasn't been a large number of major transformative applications yet. So it's, it's sort of hard to understand the scope of these. So I'm still waiting. It's going to clarify the picture a little bit to see what the first, I mean, the only real transformative hit I've seen so far has really been academia, the cheating. It does make that much easier. This is the first place where there's a wide scale impact. It requires a wide scale response. And we'll see what the next ones are, then we could probably better calibrate, better calibrate our answer once we see that. Over there, there is a student question. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you were a college student looking at entering the workforce in the next couple of years, are there any careers that you would be more wary of now in light of uh, the job transformations you talked well, about? Well, I mean, I would say transfer to the computer science department and start studying AI if you can, <laughs> if you still have time. Uh, the problem with this type of thing is it takes so long to train, like to get a doctorate, that by the time you get there, the thing that was hot is no longer hot. But uh, I can say right now, highly trained, especially deep learning trained, artificial intelligence, doctoral students, they're coming out of some of these top programs for, I don't know, $700,000 a year salaries, $800,000 a year salaries. So do that, <laughs> that might be. Um, otherwise, would I, would I be worried about a, a particular job path, let's say, disappearing now because of AI? Uh, I don't yet have a particular strong warning. Uh, another thing people would ask is, should I be, what tool should I be learning right now to be competitive? I think if you're young, these tools are so natural and easy, it's going to take you seven seconds to learn them. So I'm not particularly worried about that as well. I mean, the defining features of these tools is it understands natural language. And, and that they're easy to actually work with. So I'm, I'm not even that worried about stay really up to date with all the latest artificial intelligence technology. I think it would be fine even to say, I'm going to just put my head down and study. Uh, and then I'll just see where this tech is you know, my senior year. Oh, what's, what's a tool I might need to use? That wouldn't even be that crazy of a, crazy of a response. So, so outside of trying to profit off of this industry directly, um, it's not yet making me think, definitely don't take this job because it's going to disappear. Question on this side. Uh, yeah, thank you for your uh, lecture here. Um, uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, all of the work here has been done in the English language, which uh, is the uh, uh, is, is the de facto uh, language for science. But there are a few billion people uh, and organizations and government that uh, uh, that uh, would would benefit from uh, AI in their own language. Uh, do you, uh, this isn't your specialty, but do you have a sense of maybe uh, some countries uh, doing more than others, uh, particularly larger ones? Well, so there is a lot of non-English in these models. Um, you, I had this conversation at OpenAI earlier in the spring. I went out there and was talking with them. And they were saying there's a lot of non-English language represented in the model. The model understands a lot of non-English language. A lot of this came out of the internet scrapes. So like one of the, the primary sources of text they use to train these models uh, 
was essentially a snapshot of the internet circa 2021, which has a lot of different languages on it. Um, so even without special prompting, it's doing better than they expected with, for example, translating between languages or being able to, to talk in a particular language. That being said, you can uh, put in extra data sets in the training to make it more aware of other languages. OpenAI, I think, is very interested in this just because they see an international marketplace. So there's nothing fun. These technologies are so agnostic. It, words are broken into tokens or changed into numbers. It doesn't really care. It's very facile with different. It can move between different languages. So I think we're going to see the models get more international. The main issue they're having is uh, international regulation. Right, so I, I talked to the general counsel over there, and this guy, who's my age, has way more gray hair, because it's incredibly stressful. Uh, they did not expect, this is important to know about OpenAI, ChatGPT was not supposed to be a big deal. ChatGPT was supposed to be a demonstration application of the type of things you could build on the API that connects you to their language model. It was just a demo. They had no idea that 100 million people were going to sign up to use it. They had to basically run the Microsoft and say, we need a billion dollar investment because we can't pay the electric bill. They couldn't pay the electric bill for these queries. And actually, a lot of Microsoft's investment is basically uh, in kind because they built the data center. So like, we basically will uh, we'll tear up the bills for how much of our computation we're using. So they were really caught off guard on this, and they're getting nailed by international regulation. You know, Italy came out and essentially said, you're illegal here. You know, uh, Other countries, the EU is doing major regulation on this. The US is much more, uh, for good reason, a, very, uh, a specific reason, the US Senate is more wary about these type of regulations because these are American companies. Europe doesn't care. These are American companies. So they're happy to say, like, I don't know, it's banned. Like, whatever. Like, no one's going to get mad. So that's what they're dealing with now. Um, but there's nothing fundamental in the tech that makes it one language bound towards another. So I think in, these will become more international in, the, in their ability to, to understand different languages. We'll take one more question on that side. Oh, three, whoever gets it, Josh. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for your talk. I'd like to politely just disagree with almost everything you said. <laughs> um, I think just to point out one thing, I mean, you, you've you portrayed the situation as a, an n-gram um, pr word producer scaled way up. I think that's a mischaracterization. There's not just scale, but also the, tech, the innovation of a transformer. And a, a neural network is nothing like an n-gram uh, word producer. A neural network can encode functionality, uh, you know, all kinds of functionality. We actually have no idea what kinds of functionality are encoded in those neural networks. For instance, if, you, if what you need to do is predict the next word where, the, where you've gone through a long sequence of uh, reasoning and the next word is, like, for instance, they say, you know, you have a mystery novel and uh, the next word is, like, who did it? You know, then you really have to understand and have all sorts of reasoning and logic components to, to do that well. And there can be in neural networks all sorts of modules and components that do different tasks. So I think that, I think that we're really underestimating the uh, capabilities. And it, you know, to flip it around, the, um, it's a fallacious thing to say, you know, to look at sort of the elements and say, um, you know, the elements are simple and we understand those, so therefore, you know, the results can, can be more complex. I mean, we, we have our, yep. you could look at our brains and, and say the same thing. Uh, yeah, so th this is a good question, uh, a common one, right? So this is, this is I would say, the, uh, the, the kind of the common feedback from the, the more technical crowd. So, so, I, so I appreciate the question. So there's a couple points I want to make here to try to calibrate. Uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, feature detection and ingrams uh, is a conceptual simplification, right? So what we're trying to get at with these concepts, and it, it took a long time uh, working with the people who work on these networks to find the right set of conceptual approaches that would allow you to understand how a program could produce text that was so natural and had such semantic complexity. So it doesn't directly implement something like 
engrams uh, precisely like that. However, something like that is almost certainly going on in the sense that what we have baked into the weights of these neural networks is we are recognizing the relevant phrases that the transformers, and in particular the multi-headed self-attention aspect, have pointed out. These are the relevant words that relate with each other. Uh, we are, these are being recognized, and we do think there is some sort of statistical connection. This is the best understanding from the LLM experts I talked to for this article. It, it's a reasonable understanding, though simple of what's happening here. It's, we're, we're looking at relationships between these words uh, and existing examples of these words to see what can come next. Now, the point about the reasoning can be pretty complicated is a good one. In fact, OpenAI, what they're trying to do, Sam uh, Altman over there is, wants to refer to these models as reasoning engines instead of language models. You can understand that, however, in the context of feature detection. Feature detection is a very complicated thing. So features can be quite nuanced. It, it can be uh, what we're doing here is a detective plot. We recognize, this feature recognizes, this is something like a detective plot, and uh, this is the investigator, and these are the suspects. You could have a feature detection rule that could understand that, right? And then it could be uh, pretty complicated. Then, okay, so what we want to do is, uh, this is a suspect, and we understand they're saying that this suspect is not the one who did it, so now we're producing word that would make sense in a detective novel where this is the investigator and these are the suspects and it's not the suspect. And so all of that can go into how we think about the words we're going to output next. But ultimately what's going to be output in the end is going to be a, a vector of confidence predictions for each of the possible next words that can come next. So these are vast simplifications, but they're not, I don't think they're conceptually foreign, right? This is more or less complicated feature detection plus statistical relationships between words from, from actual books. That's more or less what is, actually, what is actually happening. But I think it's important to emphasize this feature detection can be very complicated. I mean, in order to figure out the right next word, these features can be incredibly complicated. It could be doing something almost like basic reasoning to try to get to the answer of we should put a lot of emphasis on on this next word of the possible next words that, that might make sense here. So I think the point is right that this is simplifying, but I think conceptually we're actually in the right realm. Um, and then for the point about the human brain, again, I think this is a good one as well. Uh, it's not just saying we can reduce down to, in the end, we have simple connections or something like this, and, and how can we get complex behavior from that? Because you're right, the human brain, in the end, we can go down to neurons, and we can look at how a particular neuron functions. But I think in particular, the architecture of networks in language models is a simple architecture. It's a feed-forward architecture. One layer connects to the next layer. This is different, for example, than an RNN for a recurrent neural network, where you're going to have the network itself can actually go back and influence uh, its state for the next iteration. It is, by definition, a very simple architecture because it needs to be implemented by just matrix multiplications done at a very large scale. So the actual specific architecture of these language models uh, is simple. It has to be simple, as compared, for example, to the architecture of the parts of the human brains where the neural correlates of consciousness researchers think this is where we think uh, conscious experience is formed. These are defined by incredibly complicated neural architectures. We have recurrences. We have uh, recursion and self-reference and uh, structures we don't even understand. Feed-forward networks, by definition, have to be uh, they have to be very simple. Um, so I, I think that's, that's part of it as well. And, and then the other part to throw in there is the lack of state is a big one. You, you can't have self-awareness if you can't change even a single bit of your definition. You have to have some ability to update your understanding of yourself in the world and your relationship to, to other objects. So these, these, these particular networks uh, don't have it. You also need persistence of state. Uh, where what we have here is these models are split over multiple GPUs, and we have thousands of copies all running, and this GPU is just running this layer, and it doesn't even, it, it might not even talk to the same GPUs for one actual token prediction, so there's a, a persistence problem as well. All that being said, though, I, what, I wanna, what I wanna validate and, and justify here is, yes, this is way more complicated, and the complexity of what these, how it detects and figures out what to come next is stunning in its uh, scope and its scale and the, the, uh, the size it has. But we also have researchers, cognitive artificial intelligence researchers, who uh, really are pushing these things. And they do have what's called functional linguistic competence. It can really understand and produce language very well. Um, but when you really push it past familiar patterns, 
when it comes to what's called uh, functional linguistic competence, the, the sort of the, how do I plan or understand other minds or how do I uh, make predictions on, on what someone else is going to do, these are things that non-linguistic parts of the human brain do, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, the language models don't do as well. So I think they are amazing, but I do think those two metaphors are very good ones for understanding how it's possible to produce text without having to simulate in your mind like a human does, simulate a scenario and then describe what we see in text. You know, that's not what they do. They produce a single word at a time, and something like that architecture goes into it. Um, so it is a simplification, and we shouldn't put down how complicated it is. But it is a reasonable metaphor. I, I do believe it is a reasonable metaphor. And I do believe the argument that there is no, uh, no self-awareness there. It's not just a misunderstanding. I do, I do feel strongly about that as well. But I think it's, a, it's a, the, the perfect actual, I'm glad you asked it. We need that, we need that as part of the conversation. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated technology, and it's hard to figure out what level to talk about it. So, so thank you for that. Great final question, and uh, Cal will be up here to bring your books to sign and ask him other provocative questions. <laughs> will you join me in thanking Cal? Thank you.